And I wanted to thank the organizers at Ortho World for setting up another great meeting where we all get together once a year here in Chicago now that we're past COVID. So glad you're here. Thank you. The main objective of this session is for us to teach you about what we know about the clinical need and the industry drivers for ceramic coatings and surface modifications to orthopedic implants and antimicrobial coatings and surface modifications. My speakers are going to tell you about their experience with their materials and their work in R&D. And then I'm going to finish the third speaker with the regulatory pathways and why you have those certain options in regulatory to bring a product to market. So we're going to listen to Chris Weber first. He's director of R&D at Total Joint Orthopedics, and he's going to talk to you about a coating and a material to eliminate cobalt chrome from total knee arthroplasty. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, OmTech, also for the invitation to speak. And uh, I'm Chris Weber from Total Joint Orthopedics. I uh, am here to uh, talk about a uh, uh, implant coating that TJO developed, um, and uh, both how and why we developed that coating. So, uh, a little bit of an introduction to TJO. Uh, we're a growing orthopedics company. We have uh, become known for innovative solutions in the uh, joint replacement space. Uh, we have uh, both instrumentation and this particular implant that we're talking about um, for innovations. Uh, one thing that is core to our DNA is that we reserve one joint for every 10 that are implanted for donation, and uh, we donate to uh, organizations like Operation Walk and, uh, and other similar, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end. Um, <clears throat> so 18 months ago, we, we introduced a titanium femur uh, as an alternative to cobalt chrome, which is used uh, pretty standardly across the industry. Uh, so <clears throat> we'll go through why and then how we got there. <clears throat> so. One of the prompts for this session is uh, how market forces drive demand for new coatings. Uh, and uh, at TJO, we work very closely with surgeons. We're surgeon founded, and uh, we have surgeon advisors as part of each of our projects. So uh, uh, we hear a lot about what happens clinically. And uh, uh, here are two references, which uh, are you know, part of a universe of references that we could include. Uh, but uh, there's mounting evidence essentially that there is metal sensitivity and that cobalt chrome uh, can potentially be harmful for the human body. So um, from a surgeon perspective, that was an input uh, that we took as part of this project. There are supply chain challenges with cobalt chrome. Uh, it's becoming harder to source with competition uh, with some other uh, industries. And then also new MDR standards uh, for cobalt chrome labeling and potentially biocompatibility testing. So, so we set out to, to bring to market an alternative that is a, a true alternative to what the industry standard is in cobalt chrome. And um, so there we go. Um, so where we landed was a uh, what we call Orem technology. This is a wrought titanium alloy uh, substrate, which is intentionally a non-cobalt chrome alloy, and uh, we chose that because it's, uh, we don't we didn't want to include any ion sources within the this implant. Um, the coating is an ion beam enhanced deposition coating of titanium nitride, and uh, that process, uh, which uh, in this graphic you can see, it produces a, what we call a ballistically bonded zone uh, between the coating and the substrate. Uh, and this is uh, this process allows for much uh, stronger adhesion of the coating to the substrate. Um, so, uh, with identifying this technology, we uh, we really set out to test it uh, and demonstrate that it is truly a, an alternative 
and uh, equivalent to Cobalt Chrome, uh, which is the industry standard. go. <clears throat> go back one, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, we'll just kind of talk through some of the testing that we ran uh, as a characterization for the technology. We, we looked at um, scratch hardness, so the, how hard it is to scratch the surface of the um, coated uh, substrate. And uh, we chose uh, two loads to run where a lower load, which which truly tests only the ceramic layer, and then the a higher load, which actually tests both uh, breaks through the ceramic layer and tests both the coating and the um, substrate. So, with a lower load, um, as you can see, we did get um, uh, statistically significant uh, uh, data, which showed that the Orem technology is is harder than. Cobalt Chrome, and then with the higher load, they are statistically uh, the same. And um, so this kind of first round of evaluation, we we did demonstrate that uh, this Orem technology is equivalent to Cobalt Chrome uh, when it comes to the higher scratch load, which is uh, important. Uh, with with this processing as well, we wanted to test the uh, fatigue of the substrate material, uh, and the I bed process is a lower temperature process, so uh, you know f fatigue in titanium is a concern um, for anybody who works in uh, the industry. The titanium is very uh, fatigue unfriendly, so uh, so we uh, ran this femoral closure fatigue testing. Uh, we actually ran this protocol prior to the ASTM release of this, tech, this um, testing uh, just to prove this uh, equivalency of, of the two technologies. So um, with the fatigue life curves, you can see um, <clears throat> we did get to an equivalent run out load with Orem technology. And we did uh, also have to run this testing to pass through the FDA. So. Uh, the other testing we ran was uh, knee simulator wear testing, and we did both the pristine test, excuse me, and the um, uh, abrasive wear test, the more aggressive wear. And on the left, you can see the uh, pristine testing, the average wear, wear rate for the Orem uh, femoral components was less than cobalt chrome. And on the right, you see a significant difference between them. and. Um, with a scratching protocol that was used, um, you can see in the images on the right, the orum femur on the bottom is is not uh, scratched, uh, and the cobalt chrome femur on the top shows a lot more scratching. And this is really a part of this. Uh, uh, the benefits of this technology is just the difficulty for creating scratches. So with these three tests, um, we we proved the uh, the performance of this material as a high performance material uh, and a tr a true alternative to cobalt chrome, and uh, with that, uh, then we get to the theory in action uh, with how do we create this as a product and get it out there uh, to uh, to surgeons for patients and. Um, this included significant validation work um, w within uh, both TJO and our uh, coding partner. Um, the, um, the coding, polishing, uh, cleaning, final cleaning, and uh, packaging and sterilization validations. Um, with that also moving into regulatory clearance for uh, the device testing specific to the femoral geometry, uh, as well as the testing that you've, you've seen. And then um, I've written biocompatibility three times here because I can't stress the importance of this consideration for a new material in the marketplace. Considering that material from the beginning, very beginning stages of uh, the process in terms of the biocompatibility and showing that in, uh, to the FDA. Uh, that's the one piece of advice that I would give anybody considering developing new material is consider that 
uh, from start to finish with every single thing that touches the device. Um, so with that, we have a fully uh, vetted material that we have confidence will be an alternative to Cobalt Chrome and uh, we're ready for handoff to our marketing insurgents. To date, uh, this has been on the market for about 18 months and uh, we've, uh, we have 45 different surgeons that have used it and uh, have implanted over 780 of these. So um, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of confidence in this material. So thank you very much. And just as a last note, sorry, can we just forward one more? Thank you. Um, this is uh, just a, a note about TJO and our mission. Um, we had a recent trip to Pakistan where we uh, were able to implant 78 uh, patients with our technology, which is a fantastic mission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was a good talk. Um, just another point, we're going to do question Q&A and a discussion after all of the speakers are done. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask Trey Rogers to come up here and talk about his work at Zimmer Biomet on anti-infection technologies. Thank you all for the privilege of being able to speak today. And actually, I have to give a shout out to Devendra Gorhe, my uh, colleague who actually put this deck together. And this is more his work than mine, but I'm helping present for him today. So I don't know if anyone here knows somebody who's had a total joint replacement. Hopefully, you don't know someone who's also had a joint infection. But the patient burden is intense. A bit of background on periprosthetic joint infection. The uh, impact to patient who has that is tremendous. While total joint replacements are largely very successful, we still have about one and a half to two percent of primary surgeries will fail due to infection. It wasn't that long ago that implants used to fail primarily due to aseptic loosening. And through a variety of improvements in our procedures, our implants, and our materials, we've now knocked that off the top of the list for the number one leading cause. And now infection has kind of taken that place. So depending on the registry that you're looking at, you're looking at somewhere in the range of a quarter of the implants that are revised are being revised due to infection. So that tops the list. We've got about um, 23 and 27% revision rate due to infection in hips and knees in the Australian Joint Registry there in the, the bottom right pictures. And the other registries show similar data. The pictures on the left is what a surgeon would typically be dealing with when they have an infection case, something um, you don't want to trifle with, a deep bone infection. This chart shows mortality rate in number of months on the x-axis after a revision surgery, the red line being for revisions from any reason other than infection, and the blue line for reasons due to infection. So by about five years out, a quarter of the patients can be expected to have died. To put that into reference, we've got three different common cancers on the right chart, including um, prostate cancer, melanoma, and breast cancer that all have better survivor rates than periprosthetic joint infection. So this is a significant need. Next slide. It's not just a patient impact and death issue. It's also a huge cost issue. Right now, we've got expected growth to about $1.85 billion in the US alone by 2030. And this is expected to continue to increase significantly. And 76% higher is the expected cost increase in a revision surgery versus a primary surgery. But our reimbursements are only at about 23% higher for revision versus a primary. And this is largely driven by the fact that you have higher implant costs in a revision case, increased operative costs, and longer lengths of stay in the hospital. So it is a need. What are some ways that we can address this? Surface coatings could be a key solution here. One option that has been released recently in the European Union is a back to guard coating on Zimmer Biomet trauma, trauma nails. And this is a thin, durable, non eluding noble metal coating. And its mode of action is a galvanic current 
that is produced from the proprietary noble metal chemistry on the surface that creates a long-term galvanic reaction. And note, this is a very small amount of current. It's in the picocurrent range, and so it has an effect on bacteria, but does not affect larger mammalian cells. So this proprietary chemical process um, has actually been applied to other devices as well. This isn't a new effect. It was actually launched in the 1990s for, with barred Foley catheters, which are actually made of silicon, which points out to one of the advantages of this technique is it actually has a variety of substrates that it can be applied to. Another very common option is a silver eluding implant coating, and there's different ways to put silver onto the implant surface. A couple examples of this is implant cast and Kyocera options where they have either electrochemical process or a hydroxyapatite mix with silver that is porous plasma, the plasma sprayed onto the surface. Both of these have upsides and downsides. In the case of the implant cast, you have like a 0.2 micron gold layer that acts as a carrier and bonding layer, followed with a 15 micron thick silver coating that's applied via electroplating. Somewhat of a hybrid of this would be some method where you electrochemically etch and put pits onto the surface of the implant coating and, or implant, and then load that with silver, which can later elute out. This is electrochemical to start, and then the titanium oxide has micron-sized pits that are placed into it that are loaded with silver. There's also a lot of interest right now, both in research as well as a few startup companies, um, on surface modifications that don't involve a chemical mode of action, but actually use surface topology. Many of these are inspired by nature and surfaces found in nature, an example of this would be sharklet, which they actually have um, mimicked over uh, shark skin, which is a naturally non-biofouling skin um, surface. And the size features of those uh, features on the SEM image of that sharklet surface on the right is on the exact same size scale of bacteria. And what that does is it helps prevent colonization. So bacteria have a hard time coordinating and creating a biofilm on the surface. The advantage of that is it does not involve any chemical process. On the lower left, you have examples of other surfaces found in nature, including cicada wings, gecko skin, and dragonfly wings. And some of these surfaces will actually puncture the bacterial cell wall and cause it to lice and die. Here's some SEM images of bacteria on the surface from a cicada uh, wing, as well as gecko skin showing the bacteria actually being skewered by the surface topology. The challenge here is how do you actually replicate that X scale in a relevant implant surface or instrument surface? There's a lot of innovation needed here. We can see the surfaces and they work, but it's hard to replicate at scale. So in summary, there's a tremendous patient burden as well as a financial cost to infection and implants, and there's many approaches that are possible However, there is definitely innovation that is still needed. Surface modification could play a key role, and I would advise for anyone who's going out on this journey and setting off to have a very deep understanding of the mode of action. This will drive your regulatory approach as well as your testing strategy, your controls, and your validation. And currently, there's not a lot of good options that fit all of the different modes of act action in terms of standards and tests that you can perform on the surface. And with that, I would definitely say we are not done in this space. There would be a call for action. There's a tremendous patient benefit for more innovation in this space. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll turn it back to you, Bob. Okay, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak to you about the regulatory pathways for the two things you were just uh, spoken about. So next slide, please. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about the ceramic coatings or modifications. Special 510K is very possible and doable. And in fact, I've been part of that at least once. I can't even recall if it's more than once. But the requirements to get a special 510K for the, the, the type of coating that Chris described is, one, it has to be on the same product. Like, let's talk knees. So it has to be the same design, the same material, everything, and then you coat it. That's one requirement. So basically, you're changing nothing but the surface. Second requirement is that that coating has to have been cleared on 
talking knees now, for example, on a knee in the U.S. market. So that's the second requirement to be able to go the special 510K route. If you meet those two conditions, then in 30 days, if you've done all of the other, I'll call it minimal data requirements, like most of the work that you've done for packaging and sterilization is adoptable, actually, from your prior work with your cobalt chrome femurs, and it's a very clean route to go. And, the, and a very recent example is uh, shown there from Signature Orthopedics. It was cleared in 2022 through the special route. The coating is the uh, Ion Bond titanium nitride coating, which is in the U.S. market. So that's one route with those conditions. Next slide, please. So next possibility for these coatings is the traditional 510K route. What would drive that? A new type of coating like we just heard about, right? So he had to do, I'm sure, a traditional 510K. And so if it's a new coding to the US market, that's one requirement. And or if you change the design of your implant, <laughs> then you're going to be down the road of a traditional 510K, okay? And the other key part is that there is you know, no predicate device with the same coding on the implant. So that pushes you back again into the 510K route. It's in your, as an orthopedic manufacturer, it's in your interest to find a coding manufacturer that has a master file and demonstrated proof that it works with the FDA through another 510K product. That's very important if you want to adopt a coding that's out on the market today, okay? Get one with a master file preferably and absolutely if possible with a predicate device history. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to sw switch over to antimicrobial coatings and surface modifications. So first, highest level. If it has an active ingredient, and the FDA considers silver a drug in implants, uh, or gentamicin or vancomycin in the coating, whether it's resorbable or not, it's going to throw you into the IDE PMA route, class three route, OK? And what's, what what dominates the timeline and cost of that is, of course, the clinical trial. And I'll come back and talk to that a little bit later. Another possibility for the combination product, the device-led combination product with a drug, is the, H, the HUD HDE path in the United States, where if you're focused on a specific indications for use and there are 8,000 cases, you're allowed 8,000 cases per year, okay? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that pathway and its ups and downs. And then if the, if the coating or surface modification is just that, it's with known biomaterials, whether it's resorbable or permanent, and they're known materials, a traditional, traditional 510K is certainly a path for you, okay? Next slide, please. Oh, actually, go back. I just wanted to point out that, because we're talking, the, the, the uh, images there are courtesy of Biogate. And that coating that you see on the bottom right is a, a silver aggregate about 20 nanometers thick within a, a polysiloxane resorbable polymer. It sticks around about six months over the course of reducing the potential for infection. Next slide, please. So antimicrobial considerations, de novo and PMA route. So, yeah, I forgot to say that in the last slide. So if you have the drug, device-led drug combination product, de novo is a possibility, or PMA, because it is class, class three for sure. So recommendation for sure is you engage the FDA and establish what they're going to, you know, what, what path they're going to want you to go. And you do, you, there's a 513G, I believe, is the process for that. But you can also tease that path out from de novo versus PMA in a pre-submission, because they'll tell you which one it would be. The, the, the requirements are essentially the same. Or in other words, the testing requirements, the data required for a de novo request or a PMA path. Now, my recommendation is, is that if you've got an anti-infection technology, the first thing you should do as a company is to see if you can achieve breakthrough designation. And that's actually a fairly straightforward process. There's no FDA fee associated with it. And you need to come to the FDA with 
preliminary data and evidence that your product, your coding, or your technology will likely achieve its intended goal, which is to reduce infections. And if the FDA agrees that your coding is promising and you're talking about revision and salvage joint arthroplasty, they will grant you this. And I have direct experience doing that. So it's, a, it's definitely recommended. And the reason why you want that is the FDA will give you more timely and different ways to engage them throughout all of the regulatory processes from start to finish. And they're supposed to put their best review people on your team. So that's really recommended to get step, des uh, step or uh, breakthrough designations. Um, in this case, I also strongly recommend the pre-submission because the amount of money you're going to spend on animal testing, in vitro testing, clinical work is going to be enormous. So de-risk it, do a pre-submission, and get everything flushed out and consensus with the FDA on your plan. And the, without saying, the data requirements are extensive. 10993 through ENL testing, animal work, and the level one randomized clinical trial, which the FDA will likely demand superiority, and it will likely therefore drive the numbers well over 200 cases for your control and for your uh, product that you want to use. Next slide, please. Essentially, the 510K route for antimicrobial tech is exactly what I just said, minus the clinical trial requirement, OK? In other words, if you have a coating that doesn't have a drug or an active ingredient, and it's something that uh, made of a biomaterial that is uh, known to the FDA, if you will, on other devices, then 510K is the route, and it's all of that data minus the clinical study. Next slide, please. And to, you know, if you go the HDE HUD route, there's some upsides because the main upside is there's a little bit less of a bar to cross for your test to convince the FDA that you have something that's going to be pot potentially efficacious. So in other words, the, the, the data set that's required for, say, a 510K or a PMA is less burdensome for the HUD HDE route. But there are some downsides to this you actually have to justify your cost to selling it to the hospital. You actually have to do public disclosure, kind of like when a PMA is finished and it's disclosed. Well, there's disclosure requirements for HUD and HDE. And there's an administration, administrative burden because every year you have to report to the FDA, and then there's hospital ethics committee's reports that are demanded. Next slide, please. So in summary, you know, hard-coded implants with a predicate history, special 510K or traditional 510K, whether, and, and based on whether it's in the market or if it's new. Um, Pre-submission is recommended if you have a new coding like that was described at TGO, OK? I would recommend a pre-submission to make sure that your scratch tests, your wear tests, and everything are what the FDA expects. And then lastly, antimicrobial coatings. Uh, with, with a, a, a device-led drug combination, absolutely engage the FDA early and throughout the process and get that step or breakthrough designation. And I would recommend actually going down the de novo path versus a PMA IDE. I think it's a little bit less risky, and uh, that's just some of my personal preference for that. Uh, next slide. I think that's it. I believe, yes. All right, well, thank So I'm finished speaking now, and what we're going to do is have a Q&A, and um, this is your opportunity to ask our panelists and me any questions that you would like about what you've heard about or probably anything in materials, engineering, and uh, regulatory that comes to your mind. Anybody? No? Because I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask them, but um, I want to give the audience a chance first. Okay. All right, to help maybe get the audience motivated to ask questions, um, Chris, when your company was considering getting rid of cobalt chrome, <laughs> why titanium nitride versus titanium niobium nitride? And I think there's another coating with zirconium in it. So why did you choose that particular technology? Uh, so um, we 
had a specific combination we were looking to do um, with uh, eliminating cobalt chrome ions specifically. So <clears throat> the combination of the titanium substrate and uh, process uh, and coating is something that we evaluated and uh, the uh, company we worked with provided a lot of data. Uh, being like Roy here is, uh, uh, is our partner. And um, we evaluated a couple of combinations with PVD, uh, coating, chemistry, and we really landed on this, the IBED process with the uh, titanium nitride coating as the, the coating. Uh, the, other, the other piece of it is the, the process allows for a highly crystalline coating. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very different. Not all titanium nitride coatings are the same. Uh, so that, crys that crystalline structure allows for the hardness that we measure. Okay. Very good. Does anybody have a follow-on question? Okay. I'm Da Yong Wang. Uh, I'm in material engineering. Uh, so, uh, have you ever considered the uh, using the uh, DLC diamond like carbon? That is a very hot coating uh, using uh, several other medical environment, and uh, particularly it's a very low friction. Uh, so it can reduce uh, wear and with a very low friction coefficient. So, have you put a uh, DLC in? Comp Comparison with the uh, TIN, this very traditional coating. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't. Um, it uh, it wasn't something that we evaluated. Um, I, I, uh, I comparing coatings and substrates and processing is uh, a very large group of things to consider and. Uh, with the specifics of our project, we landed on the titanium nitride. Any other questions from the audience before I go on? No. Okay. So another kind of follow-on question to what you just discussed, Chris, is should the manufacturer uh, treat these, we'll call it encapsulating coatings, because that's what they are, uh, differently or are they the same? And I think you started to address that by the material that you're covering and that kind of thing. So I just would like you to you know, speak to the different processes and, and, and what, and you've already related why I think you chose your coding, but maybe why somebody might choose a different one for cobalt chrome, yep. for example. Sure. And I, and I think it's a unique, uh, any substrate, uh, implant geometry process is a unique combination, both for the solution you're looking for and uh, the technology to use. So um, that uh, there are coated cobalt chromium uh, implants, which are to prevent the cobalt chrome from coming out of the implant. And uh, you know, e each of these kind of combinations is very unique. So. Uh, For us, it was really the uh, getting rid of the ion source potential. Um, but I, I do think there are plenty of solutions out there for other combinations. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of solutions that are available in the market. So. Thank you. Um, this question is actually for both of you. Um, I'll start with you, Chris. So what would be your prediction over the next, say, 10 to 15 years in the replacement of cobalt chrome in neoarthroplasty? <laughs> uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity, and certainly from the sort of patient perspective and what the surgeons are seeing, there's a lot more interest in looking at technologies that um, are there. Uh, one of the studies that I referenced was uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Tower. And, uh, you know, if there is cobalt chrome in an implant, then it, uh, it does uh, come out in uh, the fluids and within the bloodstream. And um, there's a lot of concern looking at this now. Uh, so I do see a lot of interest, which will 
also generate uh, new technologies and products. Ceramics, I think, is a is a significant development, but I do think will be something that we'll see a lot more of, uh, even f even to the point of having a fully uh, ceramic implant. Right. Very good. And, and what do you think, Trey? If I knew that, I'd probably be able to capitalize on it. <laughs> I'd love to be able to predict it well. <laughs> but I think there will be a, a complement of technologies in progress from a variety of companies. And I'm not sure it will be very clear in the next five or 10 years which one will be the clear one solution winner. There will probably be a combination of multiple things that slowly push that forward. I don't think it's going away, though. I think we're going to continue to push to try to reduce cobalt use. And then I'll answer my own question. I, I agree. I believe that over the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to see cobalt chrome femorals components replaced by a variety of technologies, including all ceramic. And it's going to f follow the simil tr similar trajectory that we've seen in ceramic femoral heads in the United States. So my prediction is within 20 years, 80, 90 percent of the market will have eliminated the cobalt chrome. So now I'm going to have, ask a couple of questions of Trey. So how do you QC your product? <laughs> well, I guess I would say it depends. <laughs> Our product specifically has its own challenges, but I think speaking more generically, it really depends on your particular device and demonstrating effectiveness and controlling the process. So this goes into a broader question of how do you actually develop your specifications, how can you actually analyze the coding, that's very dependent on the mode of action of the coding, and then following typical procedures for validation or verification if that's an option. In our case, we have a very small amount of the noble metals on the surface, so that proves challenging in terms of being able to find analytical techniques that can actually detect that low of levels. Thank you. Before I ask another question, does anybody in the audience have a question for both these gentlemen? I do. Uh, this is for Chris. Um, uh, my name is Steve Reese from Kyocera. Uh, I, I may have missed it, uh, but with your technology, was that a 510K or was it 510K? Yeah, uh, it was a traditional 510K. And um, the, uh, the coding chemistry is similar to other things on the market, so we were able to leverage that. Um, so uh, the testing we did was extensive um, to demonstrate that. And also for biocompatibility, uh, we did have to specifically address that with the FDA. Okay. And a second question is, um, I, I noticed in your adverse testing that you said you um, scratched the surface. But uh, uh, did you? Did you add anything to the to the testing in aluminum oxide or bone cement or anything besides just scratching the surface? Yeah, it was a uh, the the standard test is it's a diamond stylus in uh, okay. uh, open atmosphere. I mean, there was no nothing. Oh, sorry. Uh, the <clears throat> the testing process was per the per the ASTM standard, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's a scratch on the dry surface essentially it's a diamond stylus okay all right thank you anybody else before i ask a couple more okay please uh this question is for trey for the antimicrobial coatings or surface treatments how long do those need to remain active to achieve the desired effect it's a great question i think it really kind of depends on the mode of action and what you're trying to solve so in many cases, that might be implant, joint, and device specific. And there's different strategies, I think. Some might be a higher bolus at the beginning. Some might be a longer term mode of action. Probably comes down to your theory of why is it actually getting infected in the first place. And there might be different reasons for that, dependent on the joint as well. In the case of the noble metal coating that we have, it maintains a very, very long term effect. A lot of the silver coatings will release very quickly and then go away over time. If I can have a follow-on question, yeah. <laughs> um, how do you how do you show that? How do you prove that that time frame in the body? Yeah, it's a great question. There's really a lack of standards, and a lot of the standards that are available for anti-infective or anti-biofouling are very specific to certain industries, and not very helpful to us. 
So I, I would recommend becoming very familiar with the mode of action of your particular coating and then being the experts to show the FDA why you understand it over time, how it's going to perform on your device, on your surface and substrate, and in the actual application that you're using. And so in our case, we actually had to kind of create a custom proprietary test in order to even show effectiveness because it's very, it has good clinical history, but it doesn't perform well in like a drug elution type bias test, like a zone of inhibition test doesn't work at all. Um, even adherence models have a difficult time showing it. Right, and, and that data that he's speaking with what, what is essential if you want to make claims about your product and your marketing brochures when you present it to the FDA in your 510K, right? I mean, that's, that's going to be critical. Um, any other questions from the audience? I have a couple more myself, but I prefer the audience to ask the questions. Okay, I'm going to ask a couple more of Trey. Oh, do we have one more? Okay, there we go. <laughs> Hi, this is uh, Taoyong Wen again. Uh, I'm from University of British Columbia, Canada. So we have done uh, several the uh, coding research with the uh, university hospital. So I have a question about the uh, the uh, noble metal uh, coding you mentioned. Uh, you using the electroplating, right? So uh, you put down the uh, 15 micron of silver uh, layer. Uh, is is it a limitation of the uh, plating process, or is uh, there's a functionality requirement? You put down the rather thick uh, silver coating for the in anti uh, infection. Yeah, so I mentioned some silver coatings that included that 15 micron layer, but that's not actually the back to guard coating. The back to guard coating uses a very small amount of trace elements, uh, noble metals, uh, so it, it actually works quite differently. And while silver is very well accepted and established in the European market, it has a lot of hesitations in the U.S. market. Um, in large part driven by the clinical trial requirement now, and then in Europe those coatings were before the new MDRs. So now if you brought a new coating to the Europe, the path is as torturous in Europe as it would be in the United States. Clinical trial, RCT. Um, and another question, and it's kind of related to what you've been talking about, Trey. Um, you presented a few solutions, one that Zimmer Biomed is engaged in, but what do you think about the, because you're aware of, I'm sure, all of the solutions being worked on today, you know, by various companies. Um, do you think there's room for new coatings to be developed that will address ultimately infection and orthopedics? Yes, absolutely. I don't think there's a silver bullet option that anyone has found yet. And there's a lot of nuances to the problem, whether it's device specific or application specific or region specific in terms of regulatory difficulty to get it accepted. So I think there is definitely a lot of room for innovation and it really, really does benefit patients. I think kind of like I mentioned in terms of aseptic loosening no longer being the top cause for revision, I think that's when we'll be able to say, yeah, we solved this is when infection gets knocked off the top of the list. Yeah, I would absolutely reinforce what, what, what you just said because um, infection has been a major topic at the orthopedic surgeon, con orthopedic surgeon conferences like AAOS, AAHKS for f actually 15 years at least. It, it dominates almost the most important subject matter that they deal with from an academic level. And so I see in somewhere in the next 10 to 20 years, all companies will have some sort of anti-infection coding at minimum on their revision arthroplasty implants, 100%. It's happening, it's happening now, okay? Literally, I, I know and these gentlemen know, <laughs> you know, we can't talk exactly who or what, but there's a lot of activity in that space right now, okay? So I think we're at the end of our time, but if does, does anybody else have a last question or two? No. So for the infections, how much of it is related to sort of a, 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 the implant itself versus the instruments, the reprocessing or the surgical environment or those types of things? Or doesn't it really matter for this, for this technology that you're talking about? I think each implant and application is going to be a little different. And even the literature you might find might be biased towards when the data was gathered. And we've improved quite a bit in terms of our implant cleanliness and sterilization methods. And I think 
surgeons are much better in their techniques as well. Yeah. Um, I, I guess some coatings, to, I think your point and your question, are going to have a bias towards being better at perhaps solving an OR problem versus like a longer term traveling bacteria in the patient that might be more biased and susceptible to that though. Okay, well thank you very much for attending our session. We really appreciate it and thanks to the panelists here. Thank you everybody. Thanks.